Uh, good afternoon. This is the second session of the uh, 2023 Almost Heaven Star Party uh, presentations. It's uh, August the uh, 6th. And the, our next speaker is Matt Penn. Uh, Matt got his first telescope from his parents when he was uh, in the third grade, and he's been hooked on astronomy ever since. He uh, got his bachelor's in astronomy from Caltech. Uh, and did a, a senior uh, research project at the Big Bear Solar Observatory, which kind of got him hooked on solar observing as well. He, he got his PhD from the University of Hawaii and did uh, research his dissertation on sunspot umbra. And he's used uh, the uh, every major solar telescope, it seems like, in the area, but Hawaii and, and uh, New Mexico, California and such. Uh, He's, um, he decided he wanted to stay in the two, oh, he was a professional astronomer for what, uh, uh, what 26 years 30. or so. And then he, uh, they decided he wanted to stay in Tucson uh, when that job went away and he stayed, uh, uh, became an electro optics engineer in the defense industry. And, and he's still very active there. He's also on the adjunct uh, faculty for uh, Southern Illinois uh, University at Carbondale. And he has uh, been a, wonderful leader for Kate and now the Dynamics Eclipse Broadcast Initiative. So Matt, over to you. Thank you, Dan. Um, it's my pleasure to, to speak with you today. And uh, as, as Dan uh, mentioned, I definitely want to talk about the Eclipse. We've got a new team together um, to study the 2023 and 2024 eclipses. And we're calling it the Dynamic Eclipse Broadcast Initiative. Um, here's just a few of the people involved in the project. Uh, Dan is on here as well, and, and there are many others. So I apologize if I've left anyone off. Um, but uh, I'm the guy at the bottom, uh, as Dan mentioned, uh, currently an engineer, uh, but an amateur astronomer, going back to my roots, right? And uh, I, I do some work with uh, Southern Illinois University Carbondale uh, as well. I'll, I'll have my uh, email account um, at the end of the talk as well, but here's my uh, direct email, uh, mattpen2015 at gmail.com. So if you have questions or if you're interested in volunteering uh, with our group, uh, don't hesitate, send me a note and, uh, and we'll see uh, how we can fit you in. So um, just to back up a little bit and give you a little bit of an intro about why we wanna study eclipses from the ground and what can we possibly learn, right? I'm gonna give you just a couple of slides about some of the basic uh, things about eclipses. We'll review what we did in 2017. That project was called the Citizen Kate Experiment, and it was a wonderful success and inspired us now to continue that work, uh, but to try to make improvements and to incorporate what we learned from 2017. Okay, so this is a really basic idea about an eclipse, right? Uh, um, if you're in a really dusty room, like shown on the left, and you just use your thumb to occult a light bulb, to block out a light bulb across the room, um, Hopefully you won't see as many dust particles as in this photo, but you'll likely to see some dust particles floating uh, around in your room. This is scattering light off of the light bulb and it's uh, redirecting it into your eye. Um, this is kind of what we have to suffer with from the ground when we observe the corona. A uh, coronographic telescope is a little more complicated than your thumb, but same idea. We're blocking out the disk of the sun, except that sunlight scatters off of the atmosphere, off of dust particles and also off of molecules and creates a bright background, uh, which hurts and prevents us sometimes from seeing the corona. The corona is the extended atmosphere of the sun that's about a million times fainter or 10 million times fainter than the disk of the sun. So what an eclipse does, of course, is the moon moves in front of this, the solar disk, but the moon's shadow is much bigger than our thumb and it's uh, above the atmosphere. So it blocks a lot of this scattered light that we would normally get by using a coronagraph. And this allows us to see the corona uh, with much more detail, much higher signal to noise, and uh, allows us to image it better than we can from, from the ground. Um, during a solar eclipse, the sky background is about 10,000 times uh, sorry, darker than at a corona at a good solar observatory like uh, in Hawaii. And so we really want to take advantage of a uh, solar eclipse and the conditions there to do as much science as we can. So I'm sure you're all aware of uh, a group called NASA. Um, they do a lot of studies of the sun uh, from orbit uh, around the earth or from either, even further out. So what can we possibly do that would be better than what NASA is already doing? Um, in this uh, composite image, I'm showing you um, two uh, frames, two field of view of, of NASA images. The center is from the SDO AIA instrument. This shows you the, the 
corona on the disk of the sun and a little bit off of the limb. But this is limited to bright um, emission lines. These are uh, gases that are glowing at specific temperatures uh, in the EUV. Um, so we don't really see all of the plasma. What we want to do in order to see all of the plasma in the corona is to look at white light continuum. And so the NASA LASCO um, C2 instrument does just that. It uses white light and observes uh, plasma at all temperatures in the solar corona. But unfortunately, its field of view is limited to about 2 or 2.3 solar radii and higher. It can't get closer to the bright disk of the sun without introducing more stray light than they can deal with. So what happens during an eclipse is that we're able to see really far down, uh, close down to the surface of the sun in this sort of dark donut, in this data gap that exists in NASA observations. And so here's an image from our 2016 um, eclipse where we fill in most of this region with observations of white light. So we're looking at all of the plasma and the corona. Um, and we can fill in the gap between the NASA disk observations and the LASCO observations that are further out in the corona. So eclipses are still valuable. They open up this window that allows us to see the lower corona in, in more detail. So what's happening here? Why do we want to study this part of the corona? Well, I'm sure you've seen movies from the LASCO instrument which show uh, solar wind and coronal mass ejections, storms moving out from the corona, from, from the sun through the corona. In the LASCO field of view, they're moving at a constant velocity. And we know that they're not moving. They're not accelerating um, at the surface of the sun. They have a zero speed. So somehow they have to accelerate from zero up to the velocities that we see, the speeds that we see uh, in the LASCO field of view. And so what's going on in this region of the inner corona is kind of like the on-ramp to a freeway. Um, at the top of the on-ramp, you know, your car has zero speed. And then you accelerate down to match the speed of uh, flowing traffic at 75 or, or like 85 miles an hour. Um, and so what we can do by studying the inner corona is we can measure the acceleration of solar plasma in this sort of on-ramp to the solar wind. Uh, measuring the acceleration tells us a lot. It tells us um, a lot about the physics that's involved, the forces that are acting on these solar plasmas. Um, and, you know, you can get that from just looking at uh, cars too, right? Uh, if you're driving an electric vehicle down a, an on-ramp, um, you're going to accelerate a lot more fast, uh, a lot faster than like, uh, you know, 72 Chevy or something. So um, we're hoping to learn a lot about how particles accelerate in this region of the corona and then also uh, to understand, uh, using that acceleration to understand the physics that's going on. So here's our 2017 um, project in one sort of image. Um, these particles are moving fast in the corona, something like 200 kilometers per second, or sometimes even 800 kilometers per second. But because an eclipse only lasts a couple of minutes at one location, you really don't see much transverse motion in the corona during that time, during that two minute period. So what you wanna do is to stack together observations for a much longer period of time and the way to do that is to set up observing sites along the path of the eclipse. And that's what we did in 2017. We set up 70 sites from Oregon to South Carolina. And as one site became uncovered, as the moon um, left uh, one location, the shadow of the moon covered up the next location. So it was kind of a relay race across the country with each telescope collecting data as, it, as the moon blocked the solar disk. In this way, we built up a 90-minute movie of the corona and saw these motions, saw these accelerations. You can tell that we had pretty decent weather. This is actually a, a cloud image from that day. There are some clouds in the middle of the path and some in Illinois uh, as well, but most of the country had really good conditions and we're hoping for this again in 2024. So here's a sample image, uh, one frame from our movie. Uh, it's, Pretty hard to show this during a PowerPoint talk, so I encourage you to go to our um, webpage down here at siu.edu, and you can download the animated GIF yourself and take a look at, at the motions that we see from our 70 observations. But to summarize it, we, we see uh, the north and the south poles of the sun. We see some activities there. There's a really rapid outflow in the south. We see some small um, evolution near the, near the solar surface in the north. Uh, we can actually see some stars, the green and the blue circle. Um, they don't show up so well in this figure, but uh, we can see them as the corona moves, uh, as the sun moves against the background stars. 
But the main thing is that we saw the remnants of a coronal mass ejection. So in the southeast uh, limb, we can see an outflow during the 90 minutes of observations that we talk, uh, took. And this is where we focused our science research, uh, which was the ultimate goal of 2017 and also 2024. So with uh, 287 of my uh, closest friends, every, every site volunteer was a co-author on our paper, on our scientific results paper. Uh, we published this uh, result in the publications of the Astronomical Society of the Pacific. If you're interested, this is uh, open access. We paid for uh, open access so anyone can go in and, and read our results. But this figure in the graph kind of summarizes the science that we got out of the eclipse. Um, here again is a blow up of that south uh, east limb, and the arrows show the plasma motion um, throughout our, our 90 minute uh, movie. So the graph now plots um, the results from those, from those vectors by plotting um, as a function of height along the x-axis, the outflow speed that we saw, uh, the radial outflow speed. And so the dots are the actual measurements and the error bars show the range that we observed. So um, if I can give you some context, LASCO and NASA also saw this coronal mass ejection, but it was moving at about 255 kilometers per second, at a constant speed through the LASCO field of view. And these are the speeds that we measure in our data. So you can see that it's pretty small, almost zero near the surface of the sun, and kind of gradually goes up towards the Alaska um, velocity, the Alaska speed, but it doesn't do it in a nice way, uh, unfortunately. Um, if it was um, <clears throat> just a constant acceleration, so if the plasma was accelerated at 15 meters per second squared uh, faster than the solar gravitation, then it would follow this dashed line. And you can see that a lot of our measurements are are away from that line, so that's not a really good fit. You know, another ad hoc way to think about it is there is a constant, um, you know, velocity increase as a function of radial distance. That would be the dashed line, and it data doesn't follow that either. Um, so, you know, just like all good science, we're opening up sort of more questions. Uh, by providing the, these measurements. These are the first kinds uh, of white light measurements you know, of their kind. Um, and it doesn't follow an easy picture, but it uh, hints that maybe there are different acceleration mechanisms working at the same time in the solar corona. So for 2024, our goal is to basically reproduce this, look at another outflow, or hopefully several, if we have them during the eclipse, and see what kind of uh, accelerations uh, we can find there. Okay, that's the science background, and that's why we were trying to study the eclipses. Um, how do we put this project together in 2017? And then eventually, what are we going to do now? So back in 2017, um, actually well before that in 15, we started working with a group. Um, you know, in 1999, a colleague of mine, Serge Kuchmi, tried something like this in Europe to get uh, observations from amateur telescopes across the eclipse path. Um, but he was not able to publish anything. So we, we understood that we needed some practice and started a couple of years in advance. So in 15, there was an eclipse in the Faroe Islands in the uh, Northern Atlantic uh, that we took some data at with. Uh, and then in 2016, there was an eclipse in Indonesia uh, and we took more observations there and refined our, our software in particular here. And then, so that gave us about uh, a year and a half before the 2017 eclipse to, to get everything right. So in 2015, Fred Isbener <clears throat> from Carbondale volunteered. Um, he told us that he was going with his wife on a trip to see the eclipse. And we asked him if we could um, mail some boxes to his hotel, and here they are. So we trained him before this. We trained him on how to take images of the solar corona uh, using this equipment, how to do the polar alignment, operate the software, et cetera. And, and Fred had never really uh, done any astroimaging before. So um, this is a real proof of concept to take somebody who knew some astronomy but had never done imaging and uh, see if he could operate some maybe cutting edge equipment that wasn't perfect halfway around the world and actually come back with data. And, and Fred succeeded. He's, he was a fantastic uh, sport about this and came back uh, even though it was kind of raining when, when he set up the telescope 
and some drizzle going by and clouds, he actually came back with uh, some images of the corona during the eclipse. So um, we got uh, some funding then from NASA uh, to uh, do a bigger job and actually have a network in Indonesia. So we had four universities join our partnership, uh, SIU Carbondale, University of Wyoming, Western Kentucky, and South Carolina State. And so for Indonesia, we had uh, an undergraduate student and a faculty member um, from each of those universities go to four locations along the path of totality. Uh, unfortunately, the weather didn't cooperate and we only got data from one of our four sites, but the quality you can, you can tell is much improved over 2015. We had uh, better cameras and uh, much better collection software as well. So here you see the inner corona, uh, highly filtered to, to show you the, uh, the small threads and some of the prominences near the limb of the sun. So after these students got their on-the-job training in Indonesia, we hired them for the 2017 event to be coordinators. They would work with site volunteers and help them through the training and, uh, and the software, uh, using the software and collecting data uh, in preparation for 2017. And so um, in addition to that, we also had coordinators in every state. So we really relied on local expertise. Uh, I don't know anything about observing in Oregon, for instance, but Mike Connolly knows a lot about it because he lives there. And so he organized the sites uh, where the best sites were to observe the eclipse and organized the volunteers there. Um, and then the students and Mike got together and trained them through several practice runs. So we had a, a set of state coordinators. Uh, Mike's an amateur astronomer. We had some faculty members as well and other amateur astronomers uh, across the path in 2017. And then of course, um, the people who actually did the work were our volunteers or site volunteers. And here we had uh, groups from 27 universities and uh, 22 high schools, uh, national labs and uh, museums as well. So um, we really tried to focus on um, getting an educational aspect to this and the fact that so many universities and high schools joined in uh, I think we were successful at doing that. So these are the people who are taking the data and we had you know, several practice runs where we all looked at the sun before the eclipse. And then during the eclipse, the um, software was designed so that each team would you know, do all the initial calibration and set up and then hit a button and the system would take data and they could uh, enjoy the view of the eclipse themselves. They wouldn't be looking at a computer screen. So again, on the day of the eclipse, um, we had excellent weather. The sites were uh, as varied as you can get uh, from mountaintops in Oregon to you know, the plains in Nebraska, um, some suburban locations on the East Coast. And then there are a few locations that were just you know, insane for the teams who are collecting the data. Right here we are in Carbondale, and the group is there on the 50-yard line trying to collect data with uh, 10,000 fans screaming as the eclipse happens. Uh, this happened at Clemson and at uh, Tennessee Tech as well. So um, quite a variety from you know solo folks to uh, people sort of on stage collecting data. Um, but like I said, we got a lot of good data. The sky conditions were good and uh, succeeded in, in publishing the paper and measuring accelerations. What we did after the eclipse, though, um, also made an impact. And, and we designed it this way. We actually uh, purchased the equipment from uh, using our NASA grant and then gave it to the site volunteers. So after the eclipse, it was their equipment to keep and to use as they see, saw fit. So uh, Zach Stockbridge um, got together with a bunch of, of 2017 volunteers and observed the transit of Mercury from several locations across the United States. Um, he measured the uh, astronomical unit in a historical uh, way and is published in the reflector in 2020. Uh, Jennifer Burriel and her student uh, actually measured the uh, the eccentricity of the uh, corona and found that it matched previous observations, uh, considering what phase the sun was at in the solar cycle. We had some um, more advanced uh, people use our equipment to measure an exoplanet transit. And Robert Zellum from uh, JPL published uh, our results in, in his paper in, in 2020. Uh, where he looks at how uh, small telescopes can make contributions to monitoring exoplanets. So here you see the uh, a lot of data. Uh, we had a fast camera uh, measuring the 
one of the bright exoplanet transits. And then because we had so many high school students and actually a middle school student involved with the program, uh, many of them went on to, to uh, enter science fairs and win prizes. I was working with some, some students here in Tucson and we had four or five projects actually winning, uh, winning scholarship money. So that was fantastic. We're hoping to repeat the follow-up science uh, success that we had um, and to improve upon it uh, for 2024. So what would we like to do better, right? Um, one of the things I kept talking about in 2017 was that we'd love to have a movie uh, ready for uh, the evening news that night. Uh, but no one had taken data like this before, and, and the corollary to that is that no one has ever reduced data like this before. And so it proved to be a lot harder than I thought it was initially. But we want to improve that this time. We want to actually broadcast our data, our results in real time or almost real time. And so it's right in the name of our project this time, the Dynamic Eclipse Broadcast Initiative. Um, we had uh, some very good funding and some uh, excellent support from corporate sponsors as well in 2017. And um, because I'm not in the profession anymore, I didn't want to rely on, on those things this time around. So we're aiming for cheaper equipment, something that somebody might be able to purchase on their own if they're excited about the project. And so um, we've settled on a, a set of equipment that's about half the price, actually less than half of the price of what we used in 2017. Um, but we still have, actually we have better quality. We have a 14-bit camera this time and a much wider field of view this time. We're looking for people um, to participate outside of the path of totality this time, not just limit it to the, the narrow paths of totality. Um, having observations, during the partial phase allows us to see um, the surface of the sun. And we saw some eruptive events in our 2017 data. So tying those eruptive events down to the solar photosphere is what the out of path uh, participation is, is aimed at. And we also have some follow-up science projects that uh, rely on a large uh, distribution of, of observing points. And finally, we wanna make it easier um, to do nighttime work with the instrument. Of uh, the mount that we had last time, I'm really grateful uh, to Celestron who donated the mount, but it wasn't really um, easy for users, beginners, to um, polar alignment and use it for nighttime work. So this time around, we have a, a go-to mount that uh, really facilitates that. So here's our timeline. Now um, we have a couple of we had a couple of uh, solar eclipses uh, before. Um, you know, as, as practice that we could use as practice runs. The annular eclipse in October is a uh, time we'll be taking data as well, but it's only six months ahead of the 2024 eclipse. And so we're not going to be able to make probably no changes, any certainly not any major changes uh, between here. So we have to do all of our learning uh, before October. And we've used several lunar eclipses. And again, we've tried it at these total eclipses, but I'll explain that as well. The lunar eclipses have been very, very useful. So I'll review um, what we've done in the buildup to, uh, to the, our plans for October. Um, first of all was to take um, simultaneous observations. So here was an eclipse from 2021. It wasn't quite a total lunar eclipse. It was very close. Uh, back in these days, we were actually using Raspberry Pi cameras, hoping to go very cheap. Uh, but then Raspberry Pis <clears throat> virtually became extinct. So we've gone away from them. Uh, but here are two images uh, of the eclipse taken at the same time from uh, Texas and from California. And uh, if you have a 3D glasses, uh, you'll be able to see the, the lunar uh, image pop out against the background stars. So we were able to, to sort of do initial networking at this point. Using the equipment now um, that we're, we've settled on, the uh, the Player One camera and the ASCAR telescope, we really wanted to focus on getting a good HDR image and understanding how to do that. And so in the, the lunar eclipse in 2022, we were able to get um, sort of a really high uh, dynamic range from pretty faint stars, there's a small star cluster, to being able to discern uh, features on the lunar disk as well. Um, by adding up all of these images and using false color, um, can actually get a map of the lunar shadow. And so this was a little side project was, you know, we're all taught that uh, during an eclipse, the moon moves through the circular shadow uh, caused by the earth. 
But actually, when you map it out, the, the intensity is not just a, a simple circle. It's not uh, symmetric. Um, and here's a, in the lower left is a more detailed black and white image of the map. You can see different sorts of rays and areas of bright and dark. Um, and if you think about what's going on, it takes um, what uh, an hour and a half for the moon to go across the umbral shadow of the Earth. And the only reason it's illuminated is because light is refracted around the limb of the Earth uh, during that time. And during an hour and a half, the Earth rotates quite a bit. So the, the part of the atmosphere of the Earth that's illuminating the moon changes a lot. And so you expect some, some changes and some asymmetry in the shadow uh, of the Earth. And what we're trying to do is to map out the shadow of the Earth um, using our data in, in this way. But uh, again, we had uh, three sites observing this eclipse, and we were able to synchronize those and get very good uh, signal-to-noise HDR images. Uh, finally, moving on to the, the solar eclipses, again, Fred Isbener uh, volunteered to um, take some equipment to the Antarctic eclipse in 2021. Um, again, we're using a Pi camera at this time and just a simple, I think this was a 50 millimeter lens. Um, if you remember, or maybe some of you were there in, in the South Atlantic, um, there are a lot of clouds. And of seven cruise ships, only one, I think, actually saw the eclipse and that was Fred's ship. So it was lucky that he was he was on that ship. Uh, unfortunately, before the eclipse, he had set up on the side of the ship that was facing the sun and was supposed to be visible. But then at the last minute, the, the captain had to do a 180 and then Fred had to move his equipment to the other side of the ship and missed getting any uh, images of totality. So in the lower left here, you can see an image of the partial phase that Fred did capture. Uh, the bottom dark line, hopefully you can see, is the ocean, and the top is the cloud deck. So there is only about a degree and a half of window here. It's amazing that they actually saw it. But uh, unfortunately, due to those circumstances, Fred couldn't get any, uh, any exposures of the corona. Uh, then in just uh, this past April, in April of 2023, there was an eclipse that hit the northeast corner of Australia. And a team from Carbondale went to Exmouth, uh, Australia, and took some images. They also did a lot of public outreach. Here are some students working with the local um, Australian residents. So during the partial phase, we were able to collect images. And during their trip uh, up the coast through the dark parts of Australia, they were able to collect some nighttime images. But unfortunately, we had a problem uh, during totality where um, one of our student volunteers uh, hit the tripod. And uh, we also had a software issue as well, um, where we weren't collecting data during totality. So uh, this was a valuable learning experience. Um, mistakes were made, and uh, we made improvements to, to correct those. But you can see the type of data that we did collect during the partial phase. Um, here you can see some details on the lunar limb and sunspots that were visible on the disk. The team took a, a backup telescope um, with a much smaller field of view. This is, this is highly cropped, um, and it matches sort of the smaller field of view of the backup telescope. So here's, here's the data that came out of the backup telescope. It was um, a really uh, test version of a, a particular camera that we're not using. Um, but we're able to, to get some coronal structure. And if you saw the 23 eclipse, um, you know that it was a really complicated corona full of interesting structure. So the, the team captured that using a different uh, setup. Um, so um, what equipment are we using? I, I think I've mentioned uh, the ASCAR a lot. So this is a 40 millimeter uh, aperture, uh, 180 millimeter focus uh, telescope. We're using this really uh, portable and small mount from iOptron called the Sky Hunter. And uh, finally, the, the camera, the most important thing here is the Player One uh, Neptune N uh, camera. It has a, uh, an IMX178 uh, chip in it. Uh, so, you know, combined with a reasonably cheap laptop, this is something like 1700 bucks. Uh, and if people have their own mounts already or their own laptops, certainly, um, it drops down to, you know, less than half of that. So we've, been, had a lot of success, and, and we think we've found a set of equipment that does satisfy the, the cheaper 
uh, aspect of this. We're, we're much more economical than we were in 2017. So here we go. Uh, is This is a view of it. I have a tiny little laptop here, um, a micro PC. Uh, so um, that don't be fooled by the scale here. This is a pretty small uh, telescope, 40 millimeter aperture again. Uh, so it's very portable setup. Um, but we're getting excellent data through it. Here's uh, an image of the sun. We've been using a um, uh, reduction software uh, called Planetary System Stacker, which allows you to stack images and then do wavelet filtering uh, in a manual way. We're trying to, to do that uh, in an automated way and uh, not having success, uh, especially today. So we may have a different sort of Python package that we'll be using. But the idea is the same. We'll take uh, images for about 15 seconds. We'll stack them and wavelet filter them and put them on our uh, broadcast website during the eclipse. But the telescope can be um, used for night stuff, as you saw with some of those images from Australia. So here are some images I took from my backyard using the system. Uh, here's that supernova in M101. Uh, of course, the Rosette Nebula. Uh, M8 over here without any stars, with the stars removed. Um, so an interesting view of the nebula and then the horse head uh, here in the lower right. And then with just a few improvements, if you wanted to actually you know, take this equipment package and add on to it, um, you get some, some really interesting results. So background is uh, Ro Ofuyuki with, uh, I think, uh, an $800 uh, cooled camera, color, uh, one-shot color camera from player one. Um, I think there is three hours of data here uh, stacked. And then um, we're just using white light, but if you wanted to get uh, an uh, inexpensive calcium K filter from Antlia, here's their $400 or $350 filter um, showing a lot of the structure, a lot of the faculae and active network on the solar disk. Um, a lot of the images I'm showing you are from Tucson in the summer, and so uh, the seeing is not good when it's 110 degrees, so you can see the, the limb of the sun loses a lot of detail. Um, but uh, at a reasonable site or in, in the autumn or winter here, we'll have much higher, much better uh, resolution. And then finally, um, you know, we're looking at a couple of different science projects, follow-up science projects. The Exoplanet 1 is, I think, the one that people are most excited about. With our go-to mount, we're able to find um, uh, many more uh, exoplanet uh, transits to, to observe uh, much more easily than we, we did in 2017. So we expect a lot of results in this direction. Another thing is uh, that we can do is to look at asteroid light curves. So here's data from Jeff Weiss, one of our volunteers, um, taking over three or four nights looking at the asteroid Cleopatra and showing its intensity oscillation. This, of course, gives clues about the shape of, of the asteroid. And then as far as the sun goes, we're interested in two things. One is to try to observe white light solar flares at the really high cadence that we can get with these cameras at uh, 10 frames per second or faster. That has not been done. And actually, we just had a white light flare uh, yesterday that we missed. But uh, it's possible as solar activity ramps up now in the next sunspot cycle. But another thing we do is actually measure um, oscillations on the surface of the sun. Um, these are oscillations that uh, are manifested by intensity changes uh, roughly every five minutes, um, but they represent waves that travel through the core of the sun, actually. And if you plot uh, sort of the wavelength of the wave versus its temporal frequency, you can get these nice characteristic ridges in, of power uh, that, that, you know, tell us a lot about the solar interior. This may not be like a a cutting edge research program that we can do. There are telescopes doing this from space um, as well. But it's something interesting that, you know, back in the 80s, I never thought you could measure solar oscillations from your backyard, but now we can. So um, where are we at now? Um, currently, we've got funding for something like 60 sites, and including the donations from our core team, um, mostly uh, private stuff. Uh, it's more like 70 sites. So it looks like we have the funding for all of our locations or all of our planned locations. And um, this is a little bit old now. We have about 10 core team sites already and something more like 40 uh, volunteer sites. And I should cross out email. These are people who have gotten back with us, established a relationship, 
and who are about to receive equipment or about to mail uh, some equipment to our volunteers now. Um, we still could use some more um, people who might volunteer to observe, especially in, in Mexico and, and Canada. Uh, we can't um, donate equipment to Mexican and Canadian citizens, but if someone from the US would travel there and observe, then uh, we can certainly donate equipment to a US resident. And just today, um, we had a practice session um, where we had um, five locations, uh, two, two in Tucson, uh, Oroville, Tehachapi in California, and then Brandenburg, Kentucky, uh, where we were actually observing the sun. We had a different camera in Kentucky that was rotated. As you can tell, the spots are different. And uh, some of the uh, spatial filtering that we're trying to do is still preliminary. So some of these images aren't, aren't filtered, don't have a lot of detail, but uh, that's what we're working on uh, in August. Uh, before we start training our volunteers in September and October. Because then in October, we'll have people um, in the path of the annular eclipse. And in case you've missed it, the, the path uh, uh, the locations where you can see a full ring, uh, the central part of the annular eclipse goes from Oregon down through uh, San Antonio and out, out through the Gulf of Mexico here. So we'll have several people along the path to measure things dealing with mostly the lunar limb in this case. Uh, we can't do any coronal science because you still see a bright ring of sunlight around the moon and the sky is too bright to see the corona. But this will be a decent practice session. Again, we'll have all the software and, um, and the hardware figured out and in the hands of, of our first batch of volunteers. So um, this will be a good time to, to check to see you know, how their training has gone. And then, of course, the, the main event is in April of next year. Um, the maximum eclipse occurs over central Mexico, uh, but the path goes across the US and uh, uh, northern uh, Canadian, uh, Canadian Maritimes. Um, and we have, as you can imagine, a lot of volunteers in Texas and Arkansas. We could still use some volunteers in New England, if you're interested. Um, and then uh, Canada and northern Mexico. We have southern Mexico covered, but Northern Mexico and, and Canada, uh, we're still missing a few of the ideal locations. So I think that's uh, that's what I wanted to talk to you today. Uh, uh, as far as how you can get involved with us, I hope I um, made it clear that we're looking at, uh, at uh, interacting with anyone who has interest and motivation. Uh, there are several layers that you can jump in at. The core team is, is the group who um, is meeting pretty much twice a month at this point. Uh, working on the software now and uh, developing the training curriculum. And if anyone is involved in education and wants to uh, try to develop uh, more detailed classroom work that our students could use, um, now would be a good time to get involved. We could use maybe one or two regional coordinators. These are people who help the site volunteers with their training, but we have got, got that pretty much filled out, I think, at this point. But we certainly could use some more site volunteers in particular, and if you're interested in traveling internationally. So if you have uh, you know, interest or experience and you wanna get in touch with our group, here's my email or our group email is the deb-initiative. And we have a preliminary website up, but uh, certainly uh, invite you to, to take a look at that and, and check out what we're doing as well. Okay, that's all I had. Uh, let me know if you have questions. Great job, Matt, as usual. So there's still an opportunity for people to get engaged if they want to. Exactly. We're hoping to um, fill out our uh, New England sites, of course, um, and having overlap isn't a bad thing. I mean, things can go wrong during an eclipse. Cameras can be out of focus, and so especially if people want to purchase this equipment on their own. I'm not sure how much support we can have for, for people at this point, but um, it, it would be great if people could join in. I remember in 2017, uh, we were outside of Nashville. My wife had a cousin on the other side of Nashville. He was totally clouded out. We were totally clear. So in a very narrow yeah. space, you have this local weather that's uh, an issue. Exactly. Yeah.
Any other questions? John? I, I wondered um, if there would be any interest or if a mechanism to support you with equipment we already have. If we have, you know, a, like I have a, a Celestron nine and a quarter with white light filters and, and cameras and all of that stuff. I've, um, is, is there any, and I've done other things. Um, so for those of us that already have equipment but doesn't match your equipment but many of us are good enough to adapt whatever software you have as long as we had the source code to whatever equipment we're using um through you know one of the available drivers and and things like that is is there any interest in that or does that just complicate the whole story too much initially i'd have to take a pass on that um but I think in terms of a longer term uh, project, uh, I'm interested in that, of course. Um, so in 2017, we had a telescope provided by Daystar. Um, the specs were identical, but we found out that the, uh, the focal length changed by about a percent or a percent and a half. Uh, the coronal features are have a contrast of uh, a tenth of a percent and we didn't see enough stars in the background to do a real alignment on the stars and so it was very difficult to to align the coronal features from site to site from telescope to telescope um, the lunar eclipse uh, shot that i showed you the first one was taken with uh, two different telescope systems but because we had 20 background stars we could do just a called an affine transform just a general image transform and overlay them properly but that's no one's done that yet for the corona. Um, and so initially, uh, we want to get science out um, you know, from, from the, to look at accelerations. And having a uniform instrument base to do that is, is the quickest way to do that. But in terms of the long term, yeah, there's a lot of great people taking photos with their own equipment. And if there is a way to actually align those, uh, you know, sub-pixel, um, that would be, that'd be great. Okay, thanks. Other questions, comments? Just real quick. Um... So I mean, this is a great, great presentation. I'm not as in, in tune or in, as knowledgeable uh, about the material. Is there a link that we can share that we can maybe get some more information or do a little bit more deeper dive? Yeah. So the debinitiative.com uh, okay. website is is where we're storing um, our our okay. story, basically. Um, and so we'll have more details. Um, and then SIU Carbondale has a summary page of what we did in 2017 that can point to you. I mean, we can give you the, the raw data if you'd like. Uh, we have other sets of uh, other stages of process data to give you and then links to our papers as well. Awesome. I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. Okay, Matt. Well, uh, appreciated that. Appreciate the opportunity to see this, and uh, and that was uh, Deb Initiative, D E B Initiative dot com. Yes, exactly. All right, great. All right. Uh, well, we have a little bit of time before the next session is scheduled to start, so. Uh,